Greetings. I'm Nick Ravellis, and this is Opera Talk. We're here at the restaurant Sevilla in the gas lamp district of downtown San Diego to discuss one of the most interesting characters in all world literature, Don Juan. His sexual exploits, his debauchery have provided moral fodder for centuries. He began life as a fictional character in a play by a Spanish monk in the 17th century, Tirso de Molina. And ever since then, various dramatists have tried to put their own spin on the legend of Don Juan, uh, playwrights as disparate as Moliere and George Bernard Shaw. But those of us who know and love opera understand that there can only be one Don Juan. He is the creation of Lorenzo da Ponte, librettist, and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, composer. The character, the opera, Don Giovanni. The poet Lorenzo da Ponte met Mozart for the first time in 1783 in Vienna. Da Ponte had just been exiled from Venice for immoral behavior and teaching rather liberal ideas in the local seminary. Mozart at first didn't trust da Ponte because he was Italian. You see, all Italians like Antonio Salieri had taken over control of the Imperial Court Theater in Vienna. Now, Mozart wasn't sure he wanted to work with this character, but soon after they began a collaboration on Beaumarchais' great play, The Marriage of Figaro. Not long after that, the collaboration for Don Giovanni began. Figaro was a great success in Prague, not in Vienna. And the impresario in Prague decided that he wanted another opera from Da Ponte and Mozart. He got the idea from an opera that had been premiered in 1787 in Venice by the Italian composer Giuseppe Gazzaniga. This was on a libretto about Don Giovanni, or the story of Don Juan. It was so successful in Venice that the impresario in Prague thought that it would be a terrific story for Da Ponte and Mozart to try. And so indeed they did. Da Ponte used the original operatic libretto which was for a one-act opera, as a kind of skeleton or outline. And he was to flesh out the characters and then provide perfect verse for Mozart's music. Well, the verse and the music fits together so perfectly that we can believe that Mozart and da Ponte worked very, very closely on this piece. Legend has it that they were still writing the opera in transit, riding in a carriage from Vienna to Prague for the premiere of the opera. And in fact, the overture seems not to have been written before the night before the premiere. Prague loved Don Giovanni. It played to many audiences, quite a few performances, and it was a tremendous success. It was played at the Estates Theater, which is a theater in Prague which is still in active use. Unfortunately, Da Ponte and Mozart tried to bring Don Giovanni back to Vienna, where it was not very much of a success. This to the chagrin of Mozart, who tried time and again for an operatic success in Vienna, and it always eluded him. One of the glories of this opera is the richness of its characters, particularly the main character of Don Giovanni, whose exploits and adventures have fascinated audiences, scholars, and musicians for two centuries. The original title of Tirso de Molina's play in the 17th century was El Burlador de Sevilla y Convidado de Piedra. Literally, that means the trickster of Seville or the stone guest. Now, the stone guest re refers to one of the most fascinating aspects of the story, and that is one of the Don's early victims, a father that has been murdered by him at the beginning of the opera, comes back at the end of the piece as a stone statue, and he drags Don Giovanni into hell in retribution for his sins. Well, I want you to notice the word that Tirso uses to describe Don Juan, el burlador. The first meaning for this, for this word in Spanish, is trickster, 
or practical joker. Only the second meaning is seducer, or to use an old term, a rake. This perfectly captures Don Giovanni, the character in the opera. He is more interested in the chase, in the ruse, in the trick, than he is in any kind of physical consummation of the seduction. He's also the perfectly amoral character. He takes no responsibility for his actions and, in fact, doesn't even remember most of them. Donna Elvira, very early on in the opera, appears and confronts Don Giovanni for seducing her three years before, promising marriage, and then leaving her high and dry at the altar. He just completely disappears. Well, when she confronts him, he creates a diversion and leaves Leporello, his manservant there, to answer the charge. It's as if he has no memory of his action at all and will take no responsibility. At the very beginning of the opera, actually the first time we see Don Giovanni, he's rushing out of a villa, having just raped Donna Anna, and she's dragging him by the arm as he rushes out to escape, and her father, the commendatore, is not terribly far behind. This is the kind of character we're dealing with. He doesn't even take pity on a young couple that he spies on the way to their marriage ceremony. He falls in lust with the beautiful young bride, Zerlina, gets rid of Mazetto, the bridegroom, as soon as possible, and then begins another seduction. Again and again in this opera, Don Giovanni flees any kind of human retribution. Donna Elvira trying to tear his heart out, Mazetto wanting to beat him to death. He always escapes and moves on, like Quicksilver, to the next seduction. The fascinating thing about this is how the ladies in the opera, all of the women are both fascinated and repelled by him. Dona Elvira at one moment telling us that she wants to kill him, in another moment, and in fact in the same aria, says that if Don Giovanni would repent, she would have him back in a moment. E.T.A. Hoffman, in his own treatment of the Don Juan legend, talks to us about Dona Anna and how she ends up at the end of the opera. She's been betrothed to Don Ottavio throughout the entire piece, and at the end of the opera, she says that she'll put marriage off for a year. Hoffman suggests that she's putting that marriage off because she's secretly in mourning for Don Giovanni. Well, these ambiguities go on and on. What about the manservant, Leporello, who provides much of the comedy for the opera? Through the entire piece, he's always telling us with his lips how much he hates Don Giovanni, he hates the things he does, the villainy that this character stands for, and yet he sets up seduction after seduction after seduction. What are we to make of all of this? I don't really know, and it's pretty much up to you, a member of the audience, the opera goer. We spend a lot of time in this series talking about characteristic music, music in opera which captures the essence of all of the characters involved in the drama. That's particularly important when we're talking about Mozart, because Mozart was the master of characteristic music. Don Giovanni is a wonderful example of this because there are two very distinct worlds in this opera. There's the world of the aristocrats, Don Giovanni, Donna Anna, Don Elvira, Don Ottavio. And then there's the world of the rustics, the pastoral world, the world of the peasants. Leporello, surely, uh, being a servant to Don Giovanni, is one of those rustics. And then more importantly, the couple, Mazzetto and Zerlina. Let me give you an example, first of all, of characteristic aristocratic music. This is the entrance of Donna Elvira. Now, some years before, Don Giovanni seduced her and then promised to marry her. But at the last moment, he ran out of town and left her high and dry. So she enters very, very angry. But it's a kind of aristocratic or noble anger. She's holding herself back just a little bit. And the music expresses this perfectly. It's great aristocratic music. And yet, we hear a little bit of the anger underneath.
That's the introduction to her opening aria. Her vocal line is very steady, very self-contained, really quite noble. At this point, her anger goes outwards just a little bit more, and Mozart perfectly characterizes this anger by adding a little string figure. This is nothing more than an ascending scale, but it sounds like Donna Elvira is sending out darts of rage and venom at Don Giovanni. These darts accompany a text where she's talking about wanting blood from Giovanni. She's so angry at him. And still, there's a feeling of self-containment and nobility about the music. Now, the rustics, or the peasants in the story, are Mazzetto and Zarlina. When we see them, they're surrounded by their friends, and their friends are celebrating their upcoming nuptials. In fact, it's going to happen that very evening. And they're dancing and singing and carrying on as most wedding parties do. And Mozart very cleverly puts this music, this peasant music, into a new key, a simpler key, G major, which only has one sharp or one accidental. Um, and he does something else which attaches this music to the rustic world, to the pastoral world. I've got to give you a little background here. The typical rustic instrument, as far as Mozart and the world of the 18th century was concerned, was the bagpipe. What is typical of bagpipes? They play with a drone. And that drone goes throughout the melody that's being played by the bagpipe. Mozart uses drones quite significantly throughout this rustic music. Whenever we enter the world of Mazzetto and Zerlina or the peasants, he gives us little indications of that by making the, the key structure simple, by making the melodies simple, and by the use of the drone. See if you can hear it in this celebratory chorus that introduces Mazzetto and Zerlina. Actually, there are two drones going on there for the first four bars, and then another drone for the second. And a very simple folk-like melody on top, once more. A similar thing happens in Zerlina's second act aria, Vedrai Carino. Um, it begins, again, with a drone in the bass, a single note being held. Now, if Mozart used a drone throughout the aria, it would be really very boring. He just begins the aria with four measures of the held note. We also call it a pedal point, by the way, this drone. And it just gives enough of a character of the rustic, of the pastoral, to put us in that peasant world of Zerlina. And again, a very simple melody on top that could be like a folk melody. It happens again later on in this same aria.
eight measures of a repeated C. But you barely notice it. In fact, in the great duet between Don Giovanni and Zerlina, where Giovanni is trying to seduce this young woman on her wedding day, th this aristocratic character, Don Giovanni, has to enter her world. And so he sings a very simple melody. Again, it could be like a folk melody. I find what's particularly interesting is what happens when Zerlina finally agrees, turns to Don Giovanni, she says, Andiam, let's go, let's go to your castle and make love. We get a drone. This time it's a real bagpipe sound in the bass. All of this means to say that Mozart is very sensitive to these two different worlds that exist simultaneously in Don Giovanni. Now we've all heard of Don Juan, or we've heard men referred to as Don Juans or as having a Don Juan complex. This is usually a man who is a womanizer um, and who is somehow arrested at the stage of adolescence. Well, where did all of this begin? Well, it began with Tirso de Molina, a 16th century monk and playwright. He was born in 1580 in Madrid, and in around 1600, he entered a monastery. He was probably the illegitimate son of Duke Osuna, who was one of the more important noblemen of the court of Ferdinand and Isabella during the Golden Age of Spain. In 1612, he was transferred to a monastery in Toledo, and it was there that he met the great Spanish playwright, Lope de Vega. And it was between the period of 1612 and 1616 that Tirso himself probably began to write his plays and most likely wrote El Burlador. It's quite possible that the human model for the character of Don Juan was Tirso's half-brother, a nobleman who was infamous for his numerous love affairs, who had many misadventures, was accused of embezzlement, and even killed a man in a brawl. But more importantly were the ancient European sources for this story. There are many, many versions of the story of a young adolescent or a man of questionable character who at one point during his rakish behavior invites a stone statue or a skull or a skeleton or a ghost to dinner in an insulting and mocking way. Well, the ghost or stone statue appears for dinner and then issues its own invitation to dinner. And when the boy or the man appears at the cemetery for the feast, he is dragged into hell by the ghost or the statue. This is an important element in all of the Don Juan stories, and it appears in almost all of the versions. Tirso knew all the basic elements of this story from folk songs and ballads that he and everyone in Spanish culture was probably familiar with. The Don Juan of his play is contemptuous of society, contemptuous of any kind of morals or manners. He has no regard for the virtue or the honor of women. And right up until the end, he's contemptuous and arrogant of all of these things that are good. As a matter of fact, this Don Juan, after he's been saved from a shipwreck by a kindly, and gentle fisherman, repays the fisherman by seducing his girlfriend.
That's the kind of character that we're dealing with. Well, Tirso superimposes this larger-than-life villainous character on top of a basic tenet of Roman Catholic theology that was a popular preaching point at the time. That is that the nature of life the nature of time is fleeting, and that any moment death may rear its ugly head and snatch you away, that you may not have time for a deathbed confession. You may not have time to repent of your sins. Don Juan is a character who tells his manservant throughout the play that he is going to wait until the last moment, that that's what deathbeds are for. We can't help but feel that Tirso has a certain sympathy for this character, that he keeps him proud and heroic up to the moment that the stone statue, the stone guest, drags him into the fires of hell. This character is far more active and far more interesting than the Don Juan who appears in so many other versions. There were versions by Moliere 35 years later in France, uh, by Nicolas Lenau, and in the 19th century, Byron, George Bernard Shaw, even Pushkin did his own take on Don Juan. None of them come close to the raw elemental power of the original Don Juan. With the exception of Lorenzo da Ponte, the librettist for Mozart for the opera Don Giovanni. Da Ponte truly understood Tirso's creation, El Burlador. He really understood the trickster part of Don Giovanni, that he was like a kid in a candy store. No sooner did he grab a piece of candy than he dropped it and ran off for the next one. This Don Giovanni is too busy to make love. He has no time for anything except seduction. Mozart's music powerfully thrusts the character and the, the drama forward to the audience so that we are grabbed by the throat by this character. We must be repulsed and attracted at the same time. Mozart's music understands that, and it gets it across in a very witty and very powerful way. All of da Ponte and Mozart's operas are, are fascinating in terms of their ambiguity. How many of us in the audience can believe that the couples in Così Fan Tutte are going to come back together at the end? How many of us believe that the Count in The Marriage of Figaro even after that wonderful moment of, the touching moment of repentance, uh, that he's going to be faithful to his countess for the rest of their days. So at the end of Don Giovanni, how many of us believe that Donna Anna, after a year off from her engagement with Don Ottavio, is going to come back to him? Or that Don Elvira is really going to go to a convent and forget about her intense feelings and her passions for men, even men who are going to abuse her? And what about poor Mazzetto? Will he ever be able to trust Zerlina again? What happened with Zerlina off stage when she was with Don Giovanni? Mazzetto and we have no idea. These characters may have been drawn from the Italian Commedia dell'arte. They may have been drawn from the Spanish Commedia. But really, the most significant thing about this opera is that the characters remind us of ourselves. So, how do you get to know Don Giovanni? By a recording. There are a number of them available in general release at your local CD store. Let's talk about a few of them now. First of all, this brilliant recording, which was recorded live in 1953, the star of this album is certainly the Don Giovanni of Cesare Siepe, who was the greatest Giovanni of the last 30 years. And then, of course, in a relatively new recording, conducted by Bernard Heitink out of the Glyndebourne Festival. It's a recording of Don Giovanni starring Thomas Allen. Thomas Hampson has also recorded Don Giovanni under the baton of Nicholas Harnoncourt, who usually conducts period instruments, but here is conducting the Royal Concertgebouw Orchestra in Amsterdam. Many critics feel that the best recording of Don Giovanni is this one, conducted by Carlo Maria Giulini. It has a brilliant cast, Eberhard Vector as Don Giovanni. We also have John Sutherland and Elizabeth Schwarzkopf in this recording. 
of particular interest to us this season is this recording conducted by Daniel Barenboim because the singer who sings Don Giovanni on this recording will sing Don Giovanni for us in the house, Italian baritone Ferruccio Furlanetto. <laughs> There are critics, scholars, and musicians who believe that Mozart's Don Giovanni is the perfect opera. It's a very easy case to make, and you'll have to make up your own mind when you come to see it, Don Giovanni, the San Diego Opera. I'm Nick Ravellis, and I'll see you at the opera. <laughs>